Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled Transcendent Fiction where we are looking at and studying uh, um, Salah Hassan Manto's short story Toba Teik Singh. We have already begun with the story so we'll just move on and look at the text in some close details. So we, as a matter of discussion in the beginning we talked about how the madhouse in Lahore OAF becomes a very symbolic space in the sense that the questions that the madmen begin to ask about the partition, uh, the seemingly irrational questions, the seemingly nonsensical question and answers that go on uh, inside the madhouse, where they seem to actually reflect uh, or be reflective rather on the bigger irrationality, the bigger madness of partition which was engineered and uh, bureaucratized by the leaders, by the uh, policy makers, etc. So in a way it becomes a critique of partition delivered by madmen and the madman's critique in Tobatek saying this short story uh, becomes a very potent critique, a uh, very compelling critique in some sense. So we look at uh, the, the various figures in Tobatek saying and also the questions that are asked and the seemingly random and nonsensical responses which are produced out of the questions like you know if what if, if India goes away and becomes Pakistan, if Pakistan goes away and becomes India, what if both countries go away and become some other country. Now all these questions and discussions which obviously they, they seem irrational and uh, superfluous and senseless, in a sense they are actually very very fundamental questions about the whole artificial quality of nation formation. Uh, how is a nation formed? Uh, what are the boundaries of a nation? Uh, how porous are the boundaries? Uh, how, uh, how fixed are the boundaries of any particular nation? So, Toba Teik saying the short story uh, is a madman's critique of the uh, constructed quality of nation formation. It's a madman's critique of the artificial engineering, engineered quality of nation formation and how uh, nation formation is always the process uh, which is artificial, material, ideological, you know, it's invested in so many different ways. Uh, but uh, you know it seems to be a seamless thing. So the entire sacrality of the nation formation is being questioned by madmen in Toba Teik Singh. Uh, like I said the madman's presence or the mad quality of the questions, uh, the senseless, the you know, insane quality, the irrational quality of the questions uh, paradoxically produce uh, more potent uh, you know, questions, a more potent critique of the madness of uh, you know, partition in the first place. So there is this bigger madness out there uh, against which this micro madness or the micro mad men, they, uh, they have no agency, uh, they have no uh, voice. So there are two kinds of madness, two dimensions of madness uh, as it were in Toba Teik saying the outside madness of partition uh, which took away the lives of millions of people, which dislocated millions of people and which obviously created huge trauma in the minds of so many people in the subcontinent. That madness uh, you know is now obviously a rational thing, that madness is now uh, sort of frozen into a, a, a formative thing, a, a form thing, a fully formed thing in the sense of two nations. So now the madness is now in the asylum but then we are also told in some sense how this is a lesser madness, a more innocuous madness compared to the bigger, more sinister madness which was partition. So uh, we come to the central character in Toba Teik Singh uh, which is you know, a person called Bishen Singh but we also see how the Anglo-Indians uh, in this uh, particular uh, madman, uh, madhouse now they begin to feel anxious because they now are told that the British have gone away. Uh, partition has happened, so obviously they are no longer in a prestigious position or in a position of prestige. So the Anglo Indians will now fall in grace and they are beginning to conspire with each other, they are beginning to sort of talk to each other and discuss what is going to happen to the quality of the breakfast. So again, uh, the, the fact that they are focusing on the quality of the breakfast would seem irrational to us, would seem or might seem uh, mad and funny to us but then that is also very symbolic because the quality of breakfast for Anglo Indians, the, the fearing that that is going to deteriorate is obviously a symbolic projection of fear that the, the quality of the lives might deteriorate, the quality, the, the standard of living might deteriorate, the social status might deteriorate after the British uh, go away which is what exactly and historically happened. So there are two Anglo-Indians we are told this should be on a screen 
there were two Anglo-Indians in the European ward. When informed the British were leaving, they spent hours together discussing the problems they would be faced with. Would the European ward be abolished? Would they get breakfast instead of bread? Would they have to make do with the measly Indian chapati? So again, the difference in bread and chapati is um, projected, is sort of obviously, you know, becomes big and substantial in these madmen's minds. But like you said, uh, this is very symbolic. So the fact that they will quote-unquote degrade uh, into chapatis would obviously be a reflection of the degradation of their social status or the social prestige. And now we come to the protagonist and Toba takes the story. There was a Sikh who had been admitted uh, into the asylum 15 years ago. Whenever he spoke, it was the same mysterious gibberish. And what's the gibberish? Upa te gurgur the annex the bayad hayana the mung the dal of the lal time. Now, that's the Punjabi uh, sentence. What it basically translates into is that the quality of dal, mung dal, has deteriorated, has fallen uh, uh, substantially, and the gods up above uh, do nothing about it. That's what it roughly translates into. Now, again, this is a madman's gibberish, uh, which is obviously the case, but then if you read into it, uh, we find that it's possible to look at it as some kind of a political statement, uh, some kind of a madman's comment on what's happening outside. Uh, of what's happening on a daily level, the quality of dal is deteriorating, which is to say, the quality of consumption, the quality of food, the quality of nourishment, the quality of life is deteriorating. And the gods up above are completely indifferent to it. So there is this god up above, or gods up above, which obviously, you know, it can be read as a commentary of the political powerhouses, or the political gods controlling the fates of millions of people. Uh, whose dal is deteriorating every single day, whose dal is falling and stunned every single day. So a dal here, like the Anglo-Indians chapati uh, and bread, it becomes quite symbolic. It becomes symbolic of a fallen standard uh, in terms of what's going to happen when the British go away and, and what's going to happen now The Indian and Pakistan are two different countries. Suddenly two different nations have been formed. So what's going to happen to the dal? What's going to happen to the bread? What's going to happen to the chapatis? Now these are very micro questions. These are mundane questions. These are insane, irrational questions. But in a context, uh, in a political context in which these questions are asked, they suddenly become very meaningful, uh, very, very compellingly and insightfully meaningful or penetratingly meaningful. And that becomes an interesting uh, uh, quality over here. <clears throat> so the guard said that he had not slept a wink uh, uh, in all the time, in all this time. Uh, for 15 years, no one has ever seen him sleep. He would not even lie down to rest. His feet were swollen uh, with constant standing uh, and his calves had puffed out in the middle. Uh, and in spite of his agony, he never cared to lie down. So he's someone who's obviously very, very anxious. Uh, he's probably living some trauma. He hasn't slept uh, in 15 years. No one has ever seen him sit down, forget about sleeping. And as a result of which, his uh, feet have become swollen and his calf has become uh, huge. Uh, now, it's possible again that to read this body of this madman as some kind of a a body of trauma, a body of violence, a violence done on the body. You know, it's like accumulated time. It's not like normal time. It's time which is obviously one which is diseased in quality. And when that diseased time enters the body, uh, this is what happens to the body. You know, you, your body becomes restless. The body becomes swollen. The body becomes injured. Uh, the body becomes patholo pathological or pathologized in some sense. Okay, in spite of his agony, he never cared to lie down. He listened with rapt attention to all discussions about the exchanges of lunatics between India and Pakistan. So again, this, this is a common conversation in the uh, asylum now. Everyone's talking about the exchange of lunatics in India and Pakistan. People are saying, well, if you're a Muslim, you go to Pakistan. If you're Hindu, you go to India. That's how, that's how it has been decided, uh, almost mathematically speaking. So obviously, we talked about how uh, there's no agency. No one's asking the madmen where they would want to go. Uh, and obviously, these are, you, know, you can read this in even current political context across the world that uh, people who are actually suffering are not really asked in terms of what they want. Uh, the political powerhouses in certain centers are deciding the fate for them. And that's something which you know, we can see here as well in very grotesque details. Okay, if someone had asked his views on the subject, he would reply in a grave tone. Upa de Gurgu de Annex by Dhyana the Mung the Dal of the government of Pakistan. So again, you know, there's something alluding to the government of Pakistan, a reference, a mysterious cryptic reference to the government of Pakistan, which is connected to the um, quality, uh, the fallen quality of the Dal, Mung Dal. But later, on his state started substituting the government of Pakistan with Toba Teik Singh. And this is the first time we hear the word or phrase Toba Teik Singh, which is, we are told, was his hometown. 
Right, and this now becomes a very symbolic space in the story. The Toba takes saying the village from which this person is from. Uh, and he wants, uh, the, the key question that he's going to ask everyone from this point is that, and I want to go back to Toba Teik Singh. I don't want to go to Pakistan, I don't want to go to India. I reject the decision taken for me on my behalf, on, on the basis of my political, uh, you know, of my religious uh, identity. And I want to go to my own village, my native village, Toba Teik Singh. Do I have the choice? Do I have the option, the agency to do it? Of course, he doesn't. And that's the tragedy in the story, that he doesn't have the agency uh, to go back to Toba Teik Singh, which is his native village, which is his place of birth. So again, this is about choice lessness or agency lessness. So how is madness equated with agency lessness? So we see in the story how madness becomes, uh, in a sense, in a very perverse paradoxical sense, the only possibility of agency in this particular context. You know, the only possibility of agency is available uh, to madness because of madness, because madness will give you some license to say things that you are otherwise forbidden to say. Now he began asking where the Toba text thing was to go, but nobody seemed to know where it was. Those who tried to explain themselves got bogged down in another enigma. Sialkot, which used to be in India, was now in Pakistan. At this rate, it seemed as if Lahore, which is now in Pakistan, would slide over to India, and perhaps the whole of India might become Pakistan. It was all so confusing. And who could say it, uh, if both India and Pakistan might not entirely disappear from the face of the earth one day? So now that the constructed quality of borders, border making and unmaking are in play. Uh, everyone's fearing that if borders can be created randomly, they can also be uncreated, they can also be you know, recreated. Uh, so Sialkot, which was uh, India, is now seems to be in Pakistan. Now everyone's convinced that Lahore, which is in Pakistan, might slide over to India at some point in time. And there's other speculation, more wild speculation, which is saying, well, what if India and Pakistan both disappear? from the face of the earth and we have like a different landmass altogether. So everything is possible. So now with this creation, co-creation, recreation of borders that is happening so randomly, it's a random recreation of so many borders happening across the cities, across two different countries, people are asking all kinds of questions, all kinds of irrational but possible questions. And again, this is the other key thing I want to uh, emphasize a little bit, uh, the equation between irrationality and possibility. Now what appears irrational, what seems irrational, the question that madmen are asking, is actually paradoxically a possibility. Now they are saying that if India and Pakistan are formed suddenly without any consent or any decision taken by the people who live there, uh, who is to decide, who is to say, who is to confirm that tomorrow the different landmass might not appear or just take a different name suddenly. We are not, we, we're not sure of that, we, that is perfectly possible. Okay. And that's the conversation, that's the discourse going on in the asylum now. So the asylum becomes, as you can see, a very charged political space, a very symbolic space here in the context of the story. The hair on the Cyclonatic's head had thinned and his beard had matted, making him look wild and ferocious. But he was a harmless creature. In 15 years, he had not even once had a row with anyone. The older employees for the asylum knew that he had been a well-to-do fellow who had owned considerable land in Toba Teik Singh. So he was some kind of a feudal uh, you know, person, he was a gentry perhaps, he owned some land in Toba Teik Singh. The older guards knew him because he had been here for many years, 15 years now, so it's recognizable by everyone, recognized by everyone. Then he had suddenly gone mad. His family had brought him to the asylum in chains and left him there. So again, this was the uh, typical way the madmen were handled uh, back then. In Europe and also in other parts of the world, they were chained, they were coerced, there was this physical, corporeal uh, coercion done on them. Uh, so they were chained or made to sometimes parade in the cities uh, in chains and people just look at them as a spectacle of irrationality. So he was brought in chains uh, to the asylum over here and just left him there. So he was abandoned uh, by the family and was left in this asylum. They came to meet him once a month but never since the communal riots had begun. But ever since the communal riots had begun, his relatives have stopped visiting him. So again, uh, the whole idea of the relatives stopping to come becomes important here as well. Uh, because, you know, the communal riots, they interrupt the visit of the relatives. They interrupt uh, the, the coming of the uh, uh, relatives away. Yeah, that obviously becomes, uh, you know, that, that compounds his crisis, that compounds his anxiety to a large extent. His name was Bishen Singh, but everyone called him Toba Teik Singh. Now again, this is a regular example of how he morphs into a lost space. He morphs into an abandoned space, an abandoned territory. He becomes a territory by his nostalgia for the territory, by the nostalgia of the land. That he, he talks about the territory all the time. So he keeps asking people where Toba Teik Singh is. 
Uh, in the process, he becomes known as Tobias Eriksson. He becomes a space, he becomes a story, he becomes a lost and abundant space. So, you know, again, you can see the way how the human body and the abundant space, or the abundant human body, he's abandoned by his family, the abundant human body and the abundant space and morph into each other in a very symbolic, uh, semantic way. So, uh, okay, he did not know what day it was, what month it was, and how many years he had spent in the asylum. So, his sense of calendar time, his, his sense of clock time had disappeared completely. Yet, and this is interesting, yet, as if by instinct, he knew when his relatives were going to visit. And on that day, he would take a long bath, scrub his body with soap, put oil in his hair, comb it, and put on clean clothes. So, again, uh, he seemed to have this uh, proprioceptive instinct, the sixth sense, as it were, of when his relatives are going to come uh, you know, so to visit him. So, he'd wake up early that day, I mean, he never sleeps, so he'd be uh, running around uh, more active, more dynamic. Uh, he would take a bath, which is something he would not normally do. Uh, he would comb his hair, put on new clothes, and would look presentable for his relatives to come. But of course, we are told his relatives have stopped visiting him ever since the riots began, because it's unsafe to travel in the streets of Lahore as um, as a Hindu, because you know Hindus uh, are getting killed in Pakistan, Muslims are getting killed in India. It's just a big slaughterhouse across the two countries. That's the setting, and also that that kind of violence uh, on the streets is obviously interrupting the daily activities in life, the uh, normal experiences. The the definition of normal has changed uh, dramatically. If his relatives ask him anything, he would keep silent or burst out with again the same nonsensical, seeming nonsensical. Uh, uh, line, Upa, the Gurgur, the Annex, the Baya, Diana, the Mung, the Dal of the Lal time. So, again, the gods up above have no um, concern for the fall of quality of the Dal. The Dal has fallen in quality, is, is deteriorated in quality, but you know, the gods up above have no concern for the same. When he had been brought to the asylum, he had left behind an infant daughter. Uh, she was now a, a comely and strikingly a striking young girl of 15. So again, uh, she becomes the, 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 the embodiment of the time that he has lost in the sense that she was a child when he was brought and now she has become almost a lady of 15. Obishan saying failed to recognize, she would come visit him uh, and not be able to hold back his, her tears. So, she becomes an uh, example of the time that he has left behind. Uh, she becomes an example of the, uh, the past that he cannot connect back to. Uh, so, she is not recognized by Bishan Singh, she is unrecognizable by Bishan Singh. That becomes again very symbolic at a cognitive level. When the India Pakistan caboodle started, Bishan Singh often asked the other inmates where Toba Tek Singh was. That is his primary concern, where Toba Tek Singh is. I mean, he is not really bothered about what India is or Pakistan is because you know, the whole idea of the nation does not appeal to him. And that is something which is quite symbolic in the story. The nation is a very modern concept. Uh, which is lost on most people you know, at that point of time because they were more concerned about the village, about the little place they came from, the, the town, the village which had a name, but people knew each other. A nation as this big block of anonymity was something which they never connected to or never could connect to uh, at a cognitive or even political or existential level. Right? So, uh, they were more concerned about the village, the, the town, the place of birth, uh, the pond, uh, you know, the, the bazaar. So, all these local markets are more important to them. Because the local markets they were basically what informed their identity uh, in the sense that they would they, they recognize the place and they recognize the people around them and that is how they form their identity. So, anything that takes away that identity was a crisis to them at a political cognitive level. Okay. So, you know, he would ask everyone what Toba Tech Singh was, but obviously no one could tell them because no one quite knew which place is going where. And Toba Tech Singh is an insignificant space. It's not like Lahore or Sialkot or Amritsar or, you know, Delhi. So, it's not like a big city where, which, should be, which should be classified and reclassified during nation formation. Toba Tech is just a small village. So, the disappearance of Toba Tech Singh or the abandon of Toba Tech Singh is a collateral damage. Uh, in the bigger project of nation formation. And again, the whole idea over here is how things get left behind, things get abundant, how people get abundant, how spaces get abundant in this grand narrative of nation formations. So, among other things, uh, the story memento is also a very compelling critique of the grand narrative of nation formation, which completely takes away the agency of the villager, the town people, the small person from a small place who does not quite know, uh, who is cognitively confused, who is existentially confused and obviously who is politically confused because of this crisis, because of this grand narrative formation. 
So now even uh, the visitors had stopped coming uh, because of the riots, we are told. Previously, his sixth sense would tell him when the visitors were due to come, but not anymore. His inner voice seemed to have stilled. He missed his family, the gifts they used to bring, and the concern with which they would used to speak to him. Uh, he was sure that they would have told him whether Toba Teksing was in India or Pakistan. He also had a feeling that they came from Toba Teksing, his old home. So again, they were remnants to him uh, of his old home, Toba Teksing. So, and he thought that was a sort of a utopia to him. It was, uh, interestingly, it's a utopia in a different sense because normally utopia is something you look forward to. But this is a utopia you look back to. It's a very nostalgic kind of a space, which is perfect to him. This nostalgic, perfect landscape of, you know, abundance, fertility, you know, where no questions are asked, everything was perfect, etc. So it's a flawless uh, past, it's a flawless frame of time and space, which is, uh, you know, Toba takes same. It's a bit like I mean, the concept that it would be useful to understand this would be chronotop, C-H-R-O-N-O, chronotop, T-O-P-E, one word, chronotop, C-H-R-O-N-O-T-O-P-E. Uh, chronotop was a term used by Mikhail Bakhtin, the Russian philosopher, uh, and that essentially means a, a capsule of space and time, a compound of space and time. Uh, so, and it's a very handy term in memory studies. So, you know, for instance, I have an article on this uh, Toba Take Singh from a perspective of memory studies, which I'm happy to upload in um, the forum. Now, we, we, the ar article argues that how Toba Take Singh is a chronotop, the, the space becomes a chronotop for him. It's a reminder of a particular space and time put together. Right? And that is something he wants to relate to. That is something he wants to connect to all the time. Anything else around him, any space around him, any new territory, any new territorialization around him uh, becomes completely meaningless to him. So in that sense, it becomes useful category, uh, theoretical category to look at. Okay, so you know, he had a feeling that they came from Toba Tei Singh. So whoever he saw uh, who came to meet him, to, in his mind, they all came from Toba Tei Singh. That's the only place of origin, that's the only place of solace for him. One of the lunatics had declared himself God. Again, look at the, I mean, the, the irrationality of this is also a compelling commentary on the irrationality of power positions and the irrationality of appropriations of power in the world outside. So someone suddenly decides that he is God in the, in the asylum. One day, Bishan Singh asked him where Toba Tek Singh was. As was his habit, the man greeted Bishan Singh's question with a loud laugh and then said, is neither in India nor in Pakistan. In fact, it's nowhere because till now I have not taken any decision about its location. That this is very, very loaded as you can see, as you can guess. This is one madman talking to another madman, a quote unquote madman. So one madman goes to another madman and says, you know, and asks him, do you know where my village is? And the other madman who declares himself to be God uh, gives a loud laugh and says, well, you know, it's neither in India nor in Pakistan because I have not decided where it will go yet, which is a response that he would get if he, would, if he were to go to any political headquarter or to go to any political powerhouse, they would tell him the same thing, that we have not decided, we haven't filed it as such. So we can see over here the equation between irrationality and bureaucracy, between madness and bureaucracy, which is a very uh, complicated and complex and very disturbing kind of an alliance that we see. So the madman's voices in the asylum, they come perilously close uh, to the voices and responses that people would have got uh, if they were to go to any bureaucratic headquarters, any power headquarters. So the relationship between the rational or the boundary between the rational and the irrational blurs away in Toba Teik Singh in uh, very complicated ways. Okay, so Bishan Singh begged the man who called himself God to pass the necessary orders and solve the problem. So again, you can perfectly picture this happening in a real, quote unquote, real rational political space. So Bishan Singh goes uh, to a political headquarter, to a bureaucratic headquarter and begs them uh, to uh, basically give an order uh, to classify Toba Teik Singh as an Indian land or a Pakistan land, you know, depending on the, the, the choice. But God seemed to be very busy uh, uh, other matters. At last, Bishan Singh's patience ran out and he cried out, Upa de Guru the annex, the Munkidal of Guruji the Khalsa and Guruji the Fateh, O Bole, so Nihal se uh, uh, Sari Akal. Again, this is nonsensical, but he wants to say, we're told, what he wanted to say was, you don't answer my prayers because you are a Muslim God. Had you been a Sikh God, you would have surely helped me out. 
So again, uh, this sounds irrational, this sounds almost funnily uh, mad, but then this also has a lot of resonance in a political scene because, you know, every god has a religion, now. every god is classified, even gods are classified in, in partitions. So there's a Muslim god, uh, there's a Muslim powerhouse, and there's a Hindu god, there's a Hindu powerhouse, and for a person from another community or another religion to go and seek any help from the other quarter would be and just be rejected and abandoned. Uh, that's what Toba Teg Singh is saying, that's what Bishan Singh is saying over here. And again, these voices, these sentences, these expressions, uh, they are very, very meaningful given the context, given the situation that you know, the partition is, the partition had generated, the violence the partition had generated. Because a large part of the violence in partition, as we know, is not just about physical or bodily or corporeal violence, which was there. People were slaughtered, um, women were mutilated, children were killed. It was just one of the most gruesome episodes in human history. Uh, but also, uh, at a more cognitive level, it was also violence uh, which, is, which, is, which was out of epistemic violence, at a level of knowledge. Right? So, your sense of reality, your knowledge of reality, your navigation with reality, uh, changes completely or is interrupted constantly. So today you know uh, somewhere to be somewhere, something to be somewhere, tomorrow you're told it's not there, it's something else, it's been reclassified, it has a new name, it belongs to a new nation. Uh, and of course, uh, all these constant reconfigurations of reality, the re of reality, it, it almost impacts you at a cognitive level. So madness in Toba takes may be seen as a fallout of this constant cognitive negotiations with reality, this constant cognitive negotiations with re territorialized reality. So, reality is constantly being re territorialized, re navigated, reconfigured, rebooted all the time. And that constant negotiation with the rebooting reality is what makes you mad all the time. So, you don't quite know what is what. So, there's this Muslim reality, there's this Hindu reality, there's a Sikh reality, there's a Christian reality. So all realities become broken and fractured and partitioned. So, among other things, the partition over here is also an epistemic partition, a partition level of knowledge. Uh, the knowledge and rhetoric begin to get partitioned, begin to get ruptured with violence. So the violence over here becomes a very real cognitive epistemic uh, violence. And this is something which we keep seeing and Toba takes saying. Okay, so this is the response that he says, uh, gives to the uh, Muslim God. We don't answer my prayers because if a Muslim God had it been a Sikh God, it would have surely helped me out. So again, this reclassification of gods become interesting over here. A few days before the exchange was due to take place, a Muslim from Toba Teg Singh, who happened to be a friend of Bishan Singh, came to meet him. So again, look at the uh, very so cool, sinister quality with which the information is given to us. A Muslim from Toba Teg Singh, who happened to be a friend of the Sikh Bishan Singh, came to meet him. Now, interestingly, we are told that he comes from Toba Teg Singh. Now, that is a place where his divisions did not matter at some point in time, whether he was Sikh or a Muslim or a Hindu did not matter at that point in time because he came from Toba Teg Singh. But now it does matter. So it is important to be spelled out. It is important to, you know, spell it out that he was a Muslim from Toba Teg Singh who happens to be a friend of Bishan Singh. He had never visited him before. On seeing him, Bishan Singh tried to slink away, but the warden, uh, water barred his way. Don't you recognize your friend Fazal Den? He said, he's come to meet you. Bishan Singh looked furtively at Fazal Den and started to mumble something. Fazal then placed his hand on Bishan Singh's shoulder. I have been thinking of visiting you for a long time, I said, but I couldn't get to the time. Your family is well and has gone to India safely. I did what I could to help. As for your daughter, Rup Kaur, he, she hesitated. Uh, she is safe too in India. So the key thing over here is a hesitation over here, right? So he's saying, he's reporting about the family to Bishan Singh and obviously the reporters very complicated. He says that your family is gone to India, they're safe, your daughter Rupko, and they hesitate so away. And the hesitation obviously has a sinister quality. It has a very, very uh, unsettling quality. And then he says she's safe too in India. Right? So we don't quite know what safe means away. We don't quite know what she is safe in India too means away. So there's a possibility that something really bad had happened to her. Maybe she was killed, maybe she was mutilated, maybe she was sexually attacked. We don't quite know what happened and that never gets told. But the hesitation that is there before her report comes in uh, obviously carries all kinds of possibilities uh, that is told. So again, uh, it's, a, it's a, um, you know, a good example of a short story which tells you things but not saying certain things. Uh, that's something which we saw already and uh, many of the short stories have done so far. You know, Kathy Mansfield's Fly, for instance, uh, Joyce's Araby, for instance, all are very important examples so of how what does not get told, what does not get communicated you know, as actually what gets conveyed is what gets more important uh, at a semantic level.
so so he comes and tells this to uh, Bishan Singh and gives some report about different things. Bishan Singh kept quiet. Uh, Fazal then continued, your family uh, wanted me to make sure you are well. Soon you'll be moving to India. Please give my salam to Bhai Balbir Singh and Bhai Rukbir Singh and Bahen uh, Amrit Kaur. Uh, tell Balbir and the Fazaldin as well. Now it, it becomes a bit more clear because he's saying that don't you know, give my regards to your wife, uh, to your brother, etc. But he doesn't mention his daughter. So the fact that his daughter disappeared uh, from the address becomes a very important, a very um, uh, you know resonant thing. It just becomes uh, more sinister kind of an absence. So the absence of the daughter, and you can connect it back to the hesitation before the daughter's report was given to him. She too well. Uh, she too is well and safe in India and that hesitation obviously has very complicated uh, connotations. Tell Balbi that Fazaldin is well. The two brown buffaloes he left behind are well too. Both of them gave birth to calves but unfortunately one of them died. Uh, say that I think of them often and write to me if there is anything I can do. So I'll stop at this point today but I'll just unpack this a little bit. Look at the quality of um, the message over here. It's very, very domestic, it's very, very small, it's very, very little, it's very, very micro, it's very, very mundane. And that is exactly what makes it so political. It's talking about buffaloes giving birth to calves. Uh, and amidst all the political turmoil, and amidst all this political violence and the slaughterhouse which is happening around India and Pakistan, he comes to his friend of a different religious community and talks about how the buffaloes in the village had given calves. And that's exactly the kind of message, exactly the kind of report that one villager would give to another villager in a pre-partition time, in a pre-partition time of tranquility, of love, of peacefulness, of togetherness, of cohabitation, right? That becomes a thing of the power. So now this becomes completely insignificant because people want to know bigger things. There are bigger questions being asked uh, because violence has erupted at a certain level that, you know, buffaloes giving birth to cows becomes completely immaterial over here. So this comes back as an idyllic past and uh, as an idyllic territory, a uh, point in time where buffaloes giving birth to calves was a news that had to be conveyed to a friend uh, from a different community, from a different religion. So, you know, this little message uh, that Manto, you know, describes on uh, you know, a foreground so here, uh, where Fazal then, who's obviously a Muslim, comes and tells Bishan saying with a Sikh, that, you know, you remember the two brown buffaloes in their village, they were given birth to calves and they are left behind as well, you know, uh, and one of them died. Uh, so all this very mundane micro information uh, becomes very, very important and very intimate in quality. And that's something which you find in Toba Take saying that the first thing that goes away uh, during partition, when all this epistemic violence is taking place, the first thing, the first causality is intimacy. Uh, intimacy goes away, trust goes away, simplicity of things goes away. Uh, and so we have a suspicion, grand narratives. Everyone wants to know bigger questions. Everyone wants to know where he's located uh, and trust intimacy, all these different human elements which were there in the pre-partition time disappeared completely from uh, the cognitive radar. And so people keep asking about the dislocation, the alienation, and they get completely alienated from intimacy. So among the different kinds of alienation that partition generates, there's one big alienation from intimacy, from trust, uh, from simplicity. And this particular message that uh, Fazal then delivers to Toba Teixing is a remnant from the past where intimacy was still possible, where simplicity was possible and it existed in a perfectly peaceful coexistence across communities between people who consider each other as brothers, uh, which is something that he addresses Toba Teixing or Bishan Singh's family as, give my regards to brother Bulbi, give my regards to sister, Amrit Kaur. Uh, so they are all like this is like, lovely family-like relationship which is there uh, in a pre-partition time. So we get a sense of what had really been partitioned. It was not about territory, it was not about um, land masses, it's not about geopolitical uh, divisions, it's about human trust, it's about human relationships, it's about human bonds of love. Those are things which get partitioned. So this very human quality about this message is what makes it so political and quality. So I stop at this point today and I wind up with this story in the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.